Today is May 12th, 2010. I am Karen Aronson. We are talking this afternoon with Philip S. Curry, Associate Provost at MIT, who has special responsibility for the arts, international activities, and initiatives between and among schools at MIT. A historian who specializes in the Middle East's political and social history, he was Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences for 15 years, although the arts got added to the name during his tenure as Dean. Phil, thank you for talking to us. Your current job seems like an interesting mix of assignments. Who dreamed it up? How was it put together? It is an interesting uh, mix of assignments, and I had something to do with it, but I was reaching the end of my tenure, at least in my opinion, end of my tenure as Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and uh, really had just planned to go back to the faculty, get a sabbatical, which I had, hadn't had in a long while. And the president and provost uh, approached me about joining the central administration in two main capacities. Uh, one would be, would you look at the arts and look after the arts and try to promote them? Uh, and the second, an equal time, would be to help design an international or global strategy for MIT. And I said, I certainly would not take on the arts job as simply the arts job. One, as challenging as it is, I'm not an artist. Uh, I, I know I have some knowledge of at least the music and theater world having been dean in that school. That department reported to me as did creative writing within the writing program. But I thought it would be presumptuous of me to be the associate provost for the arts. International I do have some experience with. Um, and so I said, well, if you can bear it and the, my colleagues can bear it, uh, I would you know, take this on for a limited period of time. And so I agreed to do it for five years. and. I'm getting toward the end of that tenure. I have one more year, and we'll see where things go from there. Do you devote roughly equal time to the different responsibilities? Uh, I would say perhaps the accent is a little heavier on the arts. Uh, I have more staff uh, to work with. Uh, there are more demands. Uh, we actually have programs that I have direct responsibility for. We have, of course, our museum and our uh, List Visual Arts Center, and, and so I do spend perhaps a little more time on the arts, though I also do a lot of international work. Like everyone at MIT, we all do more than nine to five. It's how this place runs. And, uh, but I, I would say the accent is a bit more on the arts. And what about the line about uh, encouraging initiatives between and among schools at MIT? Right, so this comes from when you're in a smaller school, uh, my school is, you know, depending on how you count, either the third or the fourth in size in descending order, uh, you learn that one way to make things happen, make the world go round for your school, just one way is to try to build bridges to larger schools where one, there are you know, deeper resources, both human and capital, physical, fiscal, and so I, I learned to do that, for better or worse, and I'd like to think for better. And so when I took on this job, one thing that always interested me, and a lot of the activity was in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, was around what I would call the public understanding or awareness of science and technology. And so I thought that might be a leveraging point for building across boundaries, across the, you know, the major learning cultures of MIT. And while it's not the principal thing I do, I have some involvement in that and some personal interest. So I added it, really. That was my, I was told by the president, provost, craft the job, and then we'll decide whether to approve it or not, the <laughs> job description. And I, I, I threw that in because it's important to me. And, uh, and I, I'm really thinking of my old school uh, as being a centerpiece for, for the public understanding of science and technology. <clears throat> Let's talk about that international um, portion. like. Many leading universities, MIT seems to be much more interested in global strategies and international activities than it used to be. Um, one report said that MIT was involved in something like 700 international projects in 2008, and that number's probably grown since then. 
it seems like you need a spreadsheet to keep track of everything. Are there guiding principles to help determine what's worth doing and what isn't? Or does it grow like Topsy? It's amusing you ask, because yesterday we had a meeting that included uh, the Vice President for Research, myself, uh, our Director of Office of Major Agreements, and two of our uh, in-house counsels, lawyers, uh, attorneys, to talk about creating once and for all a truly comprehensive international database for all that we do internationally. We have different kinds of databases that bring much, but not all, of what we do, but not necessarily with all the kinds of information we need. I have at our you know, fingertips, really. And, and so we are going to go forward with that. We just made the decision yesterday. So yes, it is complicated. And MIT you know, has had a long international uh, you know, uh, outlook on life. I mean, science is international almost by definition and has been for, for you know, at least modern science for a good long while. Though they are not, the School of Science is not necessarily the most active in building the new kinds of large uh, uh, projects that we are doing. The, the schools that are most active in thinking about building new international uh, outreach are, of course, the School of Engineering, which is in such heavy demand. The world wants to come to the School of Engineering and get it engaged, and the Sloan School of Management. And, and in fact, the Sloan School of Mag Management is probably our uh, stalking horse, or at least the organization within MIT that takes, makes the first move, uh, often on global issues, and has the most coherent strategy um, of any of the schools for how to deal with the rest of the world, and how to embrace the rest of the world, and bring it closer to MIT in, in creative ways. And it's part, the school is uh, not large, you know, not huge, it's very centralized, and it, it, it's probably the right organizational size in which to be a leader. Um, so my job is really to work with my colleagues uh, in the leadership to try to figure out what it is and where it is MIT ought to be placing itself. Now, the world is a lot more complex than it was. And when we say it, globalization is, you know, it, it's a, a metaphor for so much, but really what we're talking about is the fact that for a lo good long while now, since the Second World War, MIT has been with a few other institutions in this country, the centers of science and engineering, big science and big engineering, at least in the realms of basic and applied research in these areas. We're not into product development as such, but we you know, create the innovation that leads to product. But the fact of the matter is the world is getting so complex, and there is enormous talent out there, some of which we have always brought to our campus. Uh, if you look at our faculty, nearly 40% of the faculty are foreign born, and they bring something special to this campus by the mere fact that they grew up in another culture for the most part. Not everyone went, comes from the UK or Canada, or English-speaking Canada in any case. The largest number of international faculty we have actually come from India. Uh, and so we're, you know, we, we, we tap into that all the time and have for a good long while, and that number is increasing, by the way. It's not decreasing. But there is talent out there that no longer can either afford to come to us, that we really want to partner with and integrate with and, and, and do collaborative work with, or they are developing their own institutions at home that say, why come to us? And so we're finding, we're, what we're really looking for, where are the hubs of innovation today? Um, what cities, what countries, it's not always the country, but it's really the city where the action is. Uh, and, and we're trying to identify the six, seven, eight places uh, that we really ought to be concentrating our resources. And it's a bit of a, a gamble, as always, because if, you've, if the place is already very established, well, I mean, they may not need us as much as we think they do or ought to. Uh, and so we're also trying to figure out is where the future hubs of innovation are and, and see if we can hit the ground running in these countries, always thinking about how do we get some of that talent to come to our campus to become part-time or permanent members of our, our community, but also we know we're going to have to spend more time with them. How systematic is that search? I mean, do you take uh, 100 or 200 countries and go down them one by one, or, or does somebody simply say, boy, they're doing this, we ought to jump on it, or how does no, it proceed? It's a mix. It really is a mixed profile. Uh, if you look around, most of the, mo the interesting projects we've concocted with other countries uh, start at the faculty level. 
Uh, it is the faculty that are most creative. Uh, it is not the upper administration in these cases. That doesn't mean that the upper administration in its uh, movements around the world don't come across opportunities. And we try in our way, from the president to the provost to myself to others, to bring back uh, these opportunities and present them to the faculty and sometimes the faculty grabs onto them. It will never work of course if the faculty don't embrace them. I mean it just there's no way the upper administration, uh, most of us are members of the faculty but spending more time doing academic administration than, than the normal jobs of the faculty teaching and, and carrying on primary research. So what we try to do is uh, figure out are these projects worthy of MIT and try to make the case to the faculty when those are the top-down initiatives and we've had a few of them. The Cambridge MIT exchange was definitely a top-down activity. Some of what we do in Singapore, which today is the country we actually have our largest projects in, have been top-down. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, sometimes they reflect the nature of how those countries are organized. Some of them are very top-down and, and so that's who you end up that's how the top comes to talk to the top, and then we go down <laughs> further into the rungs of the faculty to see what happens. I can remember some time back that uh, MIT and other universities were criticized in Washington for giving away too much of our know-how to foreign students who would go home maybe and compete with the U.S. Is that a theme that's coming up again uh, as MIT gets more international? Is there criticism either from inside MIT or from outside uh, along these lines? I think there is. I, the, the big scare and, and, uh, that I recall, uh, and it was my first years as dean, really was with Japan. It was at a time when the Japanese economy was just thriving and the U.S. economy was not doing as well and there was this great scare and sometimes, I, I hate to say it, sometimes the scare was prevented, it presented in racial terms or racist terms, and I found it very offensive, as did others. But it was this notion that Japan was here, it was investing in MIT, and it was investing largely because it knows this is where the talent is, these are the crown jewels of technology, and they were here to basically take those home and adapt them and what have you, and we were giving those away for a pittance, okay? That was the way it was portrayed, and the New York Times actually wrote about us uh, in that way on occasion. Uh, probably a bit unfair. Uh, of course, the Japanese economy uh, began to plateau and went into a, one of the longest recessions in modern history. It still may be in a form of recession today. Uh, and that scare went away pretty quickly, frankly. Uh, today, because the media helped to uh, you know, put some of this fear in the minds of people, the, the threat, so-called threat of China Will China, which controls so much, uh, you know, uh, so many U.S. dollars, will, will they, in a way, eclipse the United States? I mean, these are all reasonable things to ask. Uh, we have a kind of empire, an empire of knowledge, and will we be the only players in this empire of knowledge forever after? We've never been the only players, but whatever monopoly we've had in certain areas is likely to be broken apart, okay, and divvied up uh, in, in certain parts of the world. And that's why our international strategy is to figure out, look, how can we get the best out of China? How can China benefit from us? Because they don't want to really play with us or partner with us unless they're going to benefit, but we need to benefit. The same with India. Uh, these are huge long-term investments we're beginning to make. Uh, some find it very frustrating working with their bureaucracies or their democracies in the case of India. Um, and it is frustrating. Uh, it's a lot easier, frankly, to work with a little country that's fabulously well off called Singapore, which has the funding and knows more or less what it's trying to do in order to survive into the future and how MIT can play that role. But we know the long-term investments will not be just Singapore. They'll be these major countries. And it's not surprising that today the provost is taking off to go speak with Russia at the highest levels about how MIT could get back in with Russia. We actually had more activity with Russia on this campus and in Russia during the Cold War than we've ever had with Russia after the Cold War. And there are opportunities uh, maybe to partner with Russia in building new universities, in setting up new kinds of research projects. Russia, we tend to forget, still has the strongest base of science outside of the United States probably in the world, with maybe the exception of the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, they're ahead of China and they're ahead of Japan uh, and, and, and ahead of India in many, many areas in the physical sciences, even in the biological sciences. And yet we're spending all our time talking about India and China, as is the world. So 
could MIT get ahead of the game, get out in front with Russia and do something really interesting? And Brazil, the BRIC countries, that would complete the BRIC uh, if, we, if we do build in Brazil. And we're about to launch a new program there. And it's very, very exciting. So we are picking big targets, not just little targets. But the other criticism isn't simply, you know, are we giving the crown jewels of MIT away? I don't believe we are. But we need to be cautious about that. It's not that we shouldn't be conscious of how that could happen if we're not careful. Um, and are we doing it cheaply? OK, uh, that's also a big criticism. But the biggest criticism on this campus about what we do internationally is, one, who are we partnering with? Are these places really hubs of innovation? Or is it all about the money? And here the Middle East looms large, but not just the Middle East. And the other is, can our faculty afford to be bouncing around the world doing these projects when their first obligation must be to our students, who are among the most brilliant students in the world, a number of whom are international, uh, as we know. But can the faculty afford to be away and still do what the faculty is paid to do, which is to you know, deliver the best learning culture possible uh, to our terrific students? And, and that is a real tension. And it's not going to get any better. And we need to figure out ways of bringing the world more to our campus than our faculty going out to the rest of the world and spending quality time abroad. And that, that, that tension is there. You talked about the internationalization of the faculty and, and the large portion who were born in other countries. And I think the graduate student population is, is quite similar in that respect. But the undergraduate population isn't. Is, is that a matter that's come up for discussion a absolutely. lately? And, it's, and it's where uh, is MIT headed on that? Well, so it's hard to know where we're headed. Uh, I have co-chaired with the vice president for research, Claude Canizares, for the last three years, the International Advisory Committee, which is the committee that is designing the strategy, or trying to design, if we can really say that, uh, strategy for how we should operate for the next 10 to 20 years globally. We've issued a report that sorts some of that out, but certainly not everything. Uh, in our report, we recommended that MIT seriously consider increasing the number of uh, international undergraduates, non-US citizens who would come to our campus. Right now, we actually maintain a quota. It's about 8%. We say 8%. We're actually quite explicit about it. Uh, quotas worry me uh, for all kinds of reasons, but we do say it. And part of it has to do with the pool of American uh, students coming out of high school that remain robust, very strong, that we, you know, we turn back many more than we can possibly accept. And MIT is very self-selective in the sense that if you're not really good at math and science, you're going to have trouble here getting through our, our system, okay, because students have a core curriculum they must all go through, as everyone knows. And it's, it's a very special core curriculum. Uh, and it's rigorous, that's for sure. So. A lot of the young people who apply to us from this country are qualified to come here. And so, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's a, what do you call it, a buyer's uh, market, as it were. And so why need we go abroad? Uh, for, for graduate students, we have no quotas that I know of. And so the total number of international or non-US citizen undergraduates is approaching 40%, very high. And that number is likely to grow as well. The other issue with undergraduate uh, uh, financing is that it is a very different kind of financing system from what we do with graduate students. Um, here we provide uh, a lot of financial aid to our undergraduates, many of whom really do need this to be able to come to MIT. I mean, we're a high tuition, high financial aid organization, much as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford and a few other institutions are, those who can afford to be. Uh, we know that taking on an international student here, we must treat them by our rules. So far, our rules say they need to be treated just the way American students are. So we need to know what their financial background is. It's very hard to get good information. What we do know is that it costs more to bring an international student here. More of them need financial aid. That is, if you look at it on a per capita basis, the amount of money we need to dole out to them is higher than we would dole out to your average American student. So it's an expensive proposition. So, and right now, with the financial crisis, our timing probably wasn't the best. And so we've decided to stay with 8% with the hope that when things stabilize, we could come back to this. Uh, between us, I think uh, it's no secret it's no secret that 
we could have even a stronger undergraduate class if we increase the number of international students. I am told Yale has gone to 12 percent, but Yale's financial aid program may be different from ours, how we do business. Mm -hmm. uh, Harvard is still hovering around 9 or 10, and we proposed, at least early on, going from 8 to 12 percent, which is a 50 percent increase. Uh, and, and, uh, but that has been tabled for a while, but it's been seriously discussed, I'm happy to say. One thing that keeps coming up when the United States looks to partner with other countries are questions about um, their values and things like human rights. And there's a lot of debate back and forth about should we be working with this country or that country. Do those in issues surface here? In other words, as, the United, as MIT looks to get involved with a whole range of countries, do people sit back and say, hmm, do they have the same values we do, or do they do things in human rights that we're not happy with that would prevent us from, from going in? Um, do, do they even come up? They definitely come up. Uh, and they are debated seriously, more seriously than ever, and in, in large part because two of our largest sponsors these days happen to be countries in the Middle East, which have very different systems, uh, cultural values than we have, uh, and Singapore. Uh, and, and so really, we've been in Singapore for over a decade now, and that debate has always been there every time we begin something new. In the end, uh, we ask ourselves, do we, should we prevent faculty on an individual or small group basis from having arrangements in countries whose values we may not share, but if the faculty feel there is something to learn and to gain, uh, should we allow them to do it anyway? What re so one debate point is, should we call things that are con countries that are controversial, should we ever institutionalize it, such as the name of MIT uh, is there in an institutional way? So the program is the MIT program was, say, Saudi Arabia. Let me take perhaps the most controversial. We've decided that if the faculty really want to do it and they need to check things out, uh, and that means uh, we're interested in what, not just what white males have to say, we're interested in what females have to say, what gays have to say, what others have to say, who might be particularly uh, vulnerable to discrimination in any one of these countries for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and we found that more often than not, you will find faculty, including women faculty, uh, and in the case of Saudi Arabia, it was proved uh, that women faculty went there and felt including the leaders of the mechanical engineering department in this case, that they should do collaborations with Saudi Arabia, uh, with a particular university there that was all male. But this caused a small firestorm at MIT, as you, you can imagine, it, a lot of controversy around it. And we decided in the end that it wasn't an institutional relationship. It was between a department and a center within a department. And that was OK. But frankly, and here is the problem, is that any time MIT faculty do anything in any country, the name of MIT is there. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's not the individuals, but our name, our brand name with Harvard's, are probably the two strongest brand names in the world in higher education and research today. I can probably document that. And the, there's an inverse rule of some kind. The further you go from MIT, the better our reputation is, the stronger our reputation is. And so when people or countries say we're collaborating with the mechanical engineering department, it is always with MIT and mechanical engineering second or third in, in line. So we have to figure this out. But we do not have a policy on this, frankly, other than we will not put the stamp of MIT officially on agreements or contracts if we feel that it's inappropriate. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, we did not do that. Do you think there will be efforts to hammer out and shape a policy? Or is it one of the things that's, that people see as better left ambiguous for the moment? I think better left ambiguous. I would say that the majority, and it may be a small majority, of those who have some you know, knowledge, uh, and mm -hmm. I'm really talking to those with international experience more than any others, uh, they would feel, uh, I think, that you know, not let sleeping dogs lie. Always watch what you're doing. Always make sure. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, with the Saudi project, which is a clean water, clean energy, uh, clean energy project, and the center is located here, not in Saudi Arabia, with very little time actually spent on the ground by our faculty center, we have a women's project as well. 
uh, to bring Saudi women here for a special kind of education, and we're talking about doing something even larger on this front. So, and that was introduced by our administration as a prerequisite for going forward with an agreement, mm -hmm. that there had to be something more uh, that MIT was doing. There is a problem with that, and let me just very quickly state it, and that is, should MIT be in the, in the, in the uh, game of changing uh, cultures or social policy. It reminds me of the Bush administration saying, we're bringing democracy to Iraq. Should MIT be bringing the values of whatever, of our country mm -hmm. um, and of our institution uh, to countries and try to superimpose those values on those societies or on those institutions? That's a tough issue, uh, but it's one we're always arguing about, and that's healthy. At least we're arguing at home, but I don't think we have a hard and fast policy. Have the faculty really engaged with those issues, or does it tend to be a handful of interested people? Like so much at MIT, it's a handful, more than a handful. It's, uh, there's the Professor Jay Kaiser's notion that it's the same, you know, 20% that do everything. I mean, every committee, I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's remarkable. There are these loyalists to MIT, I don't know where they find the time, but that you can find them serving on this, that, and the other committee at all times. And so it's that community. It, it's a minority that is debating these issues. However, when they come before the faculty and they're known to be controversial, the faculty comes out of the woodwork, which it rarely does to debate these matters. And that's a healthy thing. Can you tell us where the Singapore um, project stands uh, at this point yes, and so whether it's expanding or what's it happening? It is definitely expanding and it's, it's really in three parts, uh, like Gaul in a way. Uh, it started with what we call uh, SMA1 or the Singapore MIT uh, Project 1 which was an educational project with some research and then there was a second iteration of it which is will wind down in 2013 and so that has been going now for a good 10 years, or will have gone 10 years when complete. And the third uh, dimension grew up two years ago, and it is called the Smart Center, which is MIT's largest activity abroad. This is a Singapore MIT research center, uh, fabulously well-funded, if I may say so, by the Singaporean government that does require MIT researchers to be on the ground for certain periods of time over the first five years of what will doubtless be a 10 and perhaps 15 or 20 year project, we'll see. Uh, and this project is fundamentally about research. There are small educational components, but it really started off and will always be a research project and uh, in the area of remote sensing, water research, uh, various kinds of nanotech and so on. And there and transportation now, so, and there'll be a fifth uh, major thrust area coming up, uh, which, you know, still has not been settled on. And it, so it's in its second year, uh, and again, it's mainly the School of Engineering that is involved. The, the center uh, hierarchy or the administration reports up to the vice president for research. It does not report to the dean of the School of Engineering, interestingly, so it's not just engineering, and the hope is more scientists will get involved in this, and some have. Uh, and then, just recently, last January, our president went off to Singapore to sign the latest agreement with Singapore, which is perhaps the most unusual thing we've ever done, and that is we are going to help Singapore design their fourth research university called the Singapore University for Technology and Design. And so it is a chance for our engineering school and our school of architecture to become deeply involved in developing new curriculum, curriculum that we will transfer to Singapore for this new university, but also develop for our own. And I'll come back to that in a second because it's so important for us. There's a reason uh, for why we're doing this. And we will help them to pick their new faculty. And we will, you know, we're already beginning to do that. And then we will bring the new faculty, once hired by the Singaporean University of Design, Technology and Design, we'll bring them to campus and they will shadow our faculty for a year and, and learn about this curriculum development, learn our methods for research. By the way, some of them are, will be MIT PhDs and they won't have to learn a heck of a lot. Uh, they'll just extend their, their learning. Uh, and then they'll go back and become the new faculty. The doors will open for this new university in April of 2012, to the best of our knowledge. Uh, and the first and founding president is the former dean of engineering, Thomas McNanty. 
and he will do that for a period of time and I'm sure relinquish the position to whomever else they would like. And this is a huge project and the reason we're doing it uh, is not all for the money as many people think, though again it is very generously funded. We feel that MIT has the best factors of production for design of any research university in the United States and perhaps in the world. Our peer rival Stanford gets a lot of credit for its work in design. We probably have the stronger faculty, but we've never figured out how to get our act together. And the Singaporeans are helping us through their funding, okay, through their vision, which we've helped to craft for them or with them, a chance to build up and organize ourselves in the world of design between engineering and architecture principally. And we should emerge out of this, and that's the prediction, and we'll see if we're right, as the leading place, in, not just in, in, in reality, but in terms of reputation around education and research on design. We will have a fabulous new laboratory, a center really, around um, international design on our campus, which the Singaporeans are paying for. There'll be even a larger version of it on the new campus in Singapore, so there'll be mirror sites, as it were. And so it's a long-term investment, and we're not paying for it. We're paying in our labor, in our intelligence, but in, in what we transfer to them, but we'll be transferring to them what we really plan to use here. Is there a public price tag on any of this? Does anybody know what it's going to amount to? Well, I, can, I can't tell you what the cost of the, you know, the university will be, because then you have all these scholarships for students, which we have nothing to do with. We're not picking the students, incidentally. Uh, we're just picking the faculty with their help. I mean, picking, that is, helping them to choose. They will have to decide who the faculty are. We'll just recommend. Uh, and we've done this elsewhere, by the way. It's not the first time we've helped on that front. Uh, I would say on the order of about $170 million, uh, most of which is expendable money over X number of years, plus a $20 million endowment uh, is coming to MIT. In fact, the first tranche of the endowment, half of it, has already arrived. So Singaporeans are very good about paying on time. They also expect deliverables on time. They're highly organized and demanding, as they should be. They're paying a pretty penny for this. And the Smart Center is even more funding. Yeah. So it's enormous. It's the largest. It is what Japan was to MIT. Singapore is now. And after that was announced, after President Hockfield went to Singapore, did other countries come knock on the door and say, me too, me too, come, come help us? Other countries have come since, but countries came before. I mean, this is not the first time and, and I should explain that I don't think we would have dared to take on this new Singapore University of Technology and Design, the SUTD, had we not had a decade of experience in working with Singapore. De novo, just jumping in with them and doing this would have been, I think, a disaster for us. Uh, I hope it will not be a disaster for us. I mean, proof's in the pudding. But we at least have some knowledge of the place, the culture, the leadership, and the vision. One of the other very large and expanding international efforts is MISTI, um, which I think stands for the MIT International Science and Technology Initiatives, um, that grew out of, I think, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Can you talk a little about how it started and where that stands now and how much more expansion there will be on, on that front? Sure, and I'll be brief. Uh, so this program actually grew up on my watch as dean. Uh, the first iteration of it, before it was called MISTI, actually began in the early 1980s, and it was exclusively with Japan, a very gifted professor, Dick Samuels, in, in our political science department, who heads the, now directs the Center for International Studies and has for a good long while, former department head, was a Japan specialist. And he felt that Japan was coming to these shores and sucking up lots of knowledge and information and taking it home. And part of it was that they were bothering to learn our language, they were learning our ways, and they were figuring out how they could take this back. Legally, perfectly legal. And yet the United States had very few ways of reversing the knowledge drain, as it were, or gathering what the Japanese do so well. And so we thought if we train students who are highly scientific and technical as our kids are, uh, in, in, the, in Japanese language and culture and politics and economics and send them there, they will, not only will they learn about a foreign society and culture and imbibe of that, but they will bring back some of the crown jewels, or some jewels mm -hmm. at least, from Japan. 
So that started back in the 80s and did a very, did very, very well. And it was a single you know, individual who kind of thought it up and it grew and it grew. And then another colleague, more senior to Dick Samuels, Suzanne Berger said, you know, we could replicate this in many other places, including Europe, China, and India. And so she decided to develop this vision for a, a larger MIT Japan program that became MISTI. And we are now, I believe, in 10 countries. Israel and Brazil are our, most late, our latest uh, MISTI programs, and Brazil is just about to start up. Israel is thriving after a year and a half. It's amazing how well that program is doing. Uh, lots of excitement, and we're all over the world, uh, basically training and educating students in the ways of these countries, helping them to learn the language, getting them up to at least some level of competence. I don't want to exaggerate. They're not always fluent in all these languages. Some are very tough to learn. Chinese, Japanese are. And then they go off and spend three months, six months, up to a year. We figure out how to fund them. Uh, sometimes we rely on companies. We've raised a considerable amount of endowment. And they have, this is for them, what an internship ought to be. It's not a junior year abroad or junior year semester. Really, they are down in the trenches, in laboratories, at companies, on university campuses and the like. And then they come back different. I'll tell you, they come back different. And this is where I'll stop on Misty. In the MIT is a tough place. I didn't go to MIT. I can't imagine what it's like, having taught students here for 30 years, what it's really like to go through this system, which is a grueling, tough, demanding, excellent education. These students come here at the top of the heap. They're the best students in their high schools whenever they arrive, valedictorians, this and that, star students, prize-winning Olympiads, and they come in and they find that M MIT is the great equalizer. Uh, and it isn't as easy to be number one any longer. If it ever was, it's no longer that way. And we're tough on our students. When they go away, they work along other, uh, alongside other young people. And what they discover, and this is not not just globally or internationally, down in Washington when they do this, or when they go to New York as interns, or to California, they come away realizing that they really are talented, that they have strengths that are extraordinary. And they come back with their egos not stroked, but feeling a lot more self-confident about what they can do and how the future could unwind for them in the right way. So th these programs are as good as you get, and they're perfect for MIT. Is there any kind of goal, perhaps, to raise participation um, among the undergraduates to half or three quarters of the student body, like uh, the Europe program, yes. which reaches so many? So is there Europe a timetable, or has, do people articulate this, and is it a question of funding, or what? So the Dean for Undergraduate Education had a commission that looked into the future of international education for undergraduates a couple of years ago, two or three years ago now. And they came out with the model of Europe. You're absolutely right that 85% of all undergraduates imbibe of Europe. And could we set out as a goal 85% for, uh, for the rest of this uh, institution for undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, which I had said earlier, Sloan has probably the most advanced in terms of having a strategic vision globally. Uh, that department also has a strategic vision, and it is our largest department. It is larger than the Sloan School, in fact. And in their document, which they came out with a couple of years ago, they put an 85% uh, figure out there as a goal. Okay, this is an aspirational goal, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we right now we're probably somewhere on the order of 25 to 30 percent of young people, undergraduates here, having some meaningful international experience when they're here. Uh, that number has grown fairly significantly. MISTI is the largest player in that cohort, no question, and it's likely to be even larger as time goes by. But it hasn't been easy, frankly, uh, to get numbers up. Uh, students are also on financial aid, and they have work obligations in the summer. And they have to produce a certain amount of money to uh, come through the four years here. And so how can they take a summer off to go to Japan or China or France or what have you? Uh, we're trying to sort through that. So our aim, I think, if we could get to half, 50% of our undergraduate student body in the next five to seven years, we will have really broken through, and it will be quite amazing. What we don't want is academic tourism. We're really against the idea that when our students go abroad, they're really just going on the grand tour of the 19th century. This is not what it's about. 
Have there been any studies comparing those students who participate in MISTI with those who don't, both what, you know, who chooses to go and among those who make it? How are they different when they come back from those who would have liked to have gone but didn't make it or something? So I, honestly, I don't know if we have any systematic studies of that. I think people have, some of it is anecdotal. I think we all, as I observed earlier, as I mentioned earlier, um, internships, no matter where they are, tend to bring, uh, change our students in fundamental ways. Right. And that probably is the greatest dividend of these programs. But this is the internship plus being exposed to a foreign culture, a different so you're, culture. You're, you're yeah. In, yeah. So many of these young people will work in, and they may not work in the foreign culture they have you know, spent time in as a MISTI intern or as other kind of intern, but the fact that they've had some experience uh, will strengthen them. But in a globalized world, they're likely to spend, some of them at least, a good portion of their lives working in companies abroad. Maybe they'll be American companies or multinationals with homes in New York right. or California, and that has to work to their advantage. Do they get credit, or I thought some of them earned money while they were working in these uh, posts? No, postings. they don't really, no. they're not supposed, we, we make it possible for them, you know, to get by, you know, right. helping with their housing and uh, air, airline tr and, and stipends, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the three months or whatever. Most of them are on three-month internships, that's the minimum. But the companies are not paying them. They should not be paying them salaries, yeah. So we're paying that. We get companies to donate money, so in a right. way the money is being, you know, circled back or, or back into the system. But it, there's no salary, and that's the problem. If they were earning salaries doing this, uh, that might make up, then they would have to give those funds back to MIT for the work part of what they need to do. Mm -hmm. What we don't want to do, and I, I really be, need to be careful here, what we cannot do is penalize students at MIT who wish to participate in this program, undergraduates, right. because of the financial aid situation they're in. Everyone has to have the same chance or if they wish for it, mm -hmm. and that's what we're struggling to accomplish. Most of the postings sound like they're in laboratories, science, engineering. Can humanities students participate, or is it really not for students who are studying, I don't know, economics or political science or theater? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it is, it, it replicates kind of the distribution of majors in the MISTI program at MIT. It's almost one to, I mean, the correlation is very strong. The numbers of students who major in engineering and science tend to be this, more or less the same numbers who participate in MISTI, with the Sloan School, incidentally. Um, and this, you could ask, I mean, the Sloan School, what is it there? But of course, so companies are interested in having our, our very highly analytic, mathematically strong undergraduates working for them. As, by the way, Washington government likes to get our undergraduates as well, uh, for their technical skills, for their science policy understanding, and so on. Open courseware is another newish thing that, that falls under your bailiwick, I think. Um, we're, how is that progressing, and what are the questions on the table now, if any? Yes, no, they're big questions on the table. Uh, so OpenCourseWare is actually, I think, in its eighth year now. It's only been reporting to me a little over a year, so I've learned quite a bit in the last year. We have a fabulous new director of the program, Cecilia Dolavera. Um, she's an MIT alumna and uh, brings all those talents to, to the job. And, uh, and, and she had been the technology director and, and was s selected in a, a very vigorous search, rigorous search, really, to become our new director. So I work closely with her, though, to say that I'm actually doing anything would be preposterous. She, re she and her staff are making the world go round. So the biggest issue for us is we declared eight, ten years ago when we went for this model that this is MIT's gift to the world, uh, putting its entire curriculum, albeit in, at di in different forms of development, on the web, for anyone who can access the internet, and for those who can't, we'll make disks and send them into sub-Saharan Africa so students and young people can ha and older people can have access to it. And I've, I've discovered that not only is it now 60% of those who access uh, OCW, open courseware, on the internet are international, live abroad, and that number is increasing, not decreasing. 
it's often, I mean, the largest number of people who do so are not affiliated directly to universities or to industries, but they are doing this really at home, I mean, as, as you know, extra learning, whatever you call it, you know, a, a adult learning, as you will, uh, if, if you will. They're, they're, this is an opportunity to extend their knowledge, lifetime learning, call it. And so it's very interesting who's picking up on OCW. We get a million unique hits on our website each month, which is tremendous, right? When I tour the world, as I do, uh, the two names, apart from MIT, which, as I said, the further you go away from MIT, the more people know and love us and admire us, the two institutions within MIT that get most of the attention, name recognition, are OCW and the Media Lab, okay? It's interesting, those two organizations uh, within MIT. So our biggest issue now is how can we financially sustain this model? which is a very expensive gift to give the world. We have 1,975 courses online, okay? And we have a program that allows us every several years to renew, refurbish those courses that are already online that we still offer. And we're always adding new courses as new professors come online, as it were, join our faculty. And that's an expensive proposition. So we have uh, brought in Bain consultants on a pro bono basis, I'm happy to say, with some MIT alums among them, to work with us to design different models for how we might package some of what we put online for free for executive education, for distance learning and the like. Things that MIT, frankly, are you know, both ahead and behind on in the game of, you know, of using new technologies. And we've done it, I think we could be ahead of everyone if we wish to, but we've not chosen that route because we are very pleased on, about how we deliver education to our students, uh, whether they're full-time or executive ed students or what have you. But so we're looking very seriously at these models, certificate programs, which will be controversial. We're not talking about degree programs online, which some institutions have begun to do, including Harvard through Harvard Extension. Uh, is putting you know, increasingly an online dimension to that. We have not gone that route. Certificates will be controversial. In these financial times, this may be the best time to raise the issue of would we put certificates out there for courses taken, and how would we evaluate the students who took these courses so that they could earn a certificate, saying they completed uh, 511 or 3091 or, or whatever, integral equations or something. Um, so we're looking at that. We're also looking at advertisements uh, on these courses and on department sites, uh, whether our faculty colleagues would accept that. We think they will. I mean, so far the polling suggests our faculty are willing to go ahead. The, these, the, the knowledge, the information and knowledge in these courses belongs to the faculty. They own it. So they would have to agree to allow us to advertise these and to earn monies uh, to help support the program so we can continue to deliver the free good freely to the world. Is there any kind of release time when a faculty member puts a course online? In other words, the assumption being that it probably takes some time and effort, or, or does it really take very little at this point? For the f we try to minimize faculty time on this. One, it would be too expensive, frankly. And so we have a terrific staff, a number of whom are MIT alums, graduates who are working with the School of Engineering or Shas or Sloan or what have you, uh, trying to renew and refurbish courses and add courses. So it is really the labor. It's very labor intensive. Uh, the OCW staff, who are about 18 in total number, maybe 16, I can't recall. Um, it's really their task, and we try to minimize uh, what the taxation of our faculty on this. And it's why the faculty like it. Frankly, I think if, we, if the faculty were having to do all this themselves, they might have rejected it, or they reject it today. There were a lot of accolades in the beginning um, when it was announced, but do the faculty generally talk about getting something out of it other than sort of a good feeling about helping the world? Or I think the like financial that? crisis of the last year and a half has gotten the faculty to look at different models, begin to look at different models. We had this major task force that involved over 130 or 40 faculty, most of whom are leaders on our campus, to look at how MIT could, one, figure out ways to be more efficient, tighten the belt, but also revenue enhancing ideas. I happen to co-chair the Revenue Enhancement Committee, so I, I followed this very closely. And I was impressed with our faculty's willingness to think uh, more outside the box than we have 
about ways of bringing new resources to the table, that is, to MIT, to help solve our financial issues and do interesting things with them. So I think you're right in the beginning and for most of the period of, the, of OCW's existence, it has been a very feel-good thing. As long as it's not labor-intensive, on the ba falling on the backs of the faculty, they love the kudos. And they love the fact that hundreds of thousands of people may be accessing their course in, if I may say so, Introduction to Philosophy, which for a good long while was the first or second most popular course after Intro to Computer Science. I don't think that's the case yet, but just who maybe who got out first and got their course up online. You're talking about um, online education, and it, it occurs to me that Singapore is actually one of the areas where MIT has worked on distance education. It's certainly a different model from the open courseware, but are there some lessons coming out of that? How, how has it worked and um, is, is that model changing? Or you know, I don't know enough about whether it's changing quickly mm -hmm. enough to allow us to adapt OCW to it. I will tell you that we have introduced into the budget uh, for the uh, new Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design an OCW component. And we expect that some of the materials we'll have will be massaged in a way, that is some of our courses, to be used um, or mounted as design subjects that can be delivered online with OCW getting at least some direct funding to help support what it does. Uh, but it is, it, it's making us quite nervous, to be honest with you. And to, to the president's credit, it is, she did not create OCW. It happened on the last president's watch. It was partly his vision and his courage to do it and raising the money with the big foundations that helped us, Mellon and Hewlett. Um, she has been helping to lead the effort, trying to find major donors who will support us in one way or another because she believes in, this, in, in OCW. It's hard to argue against it, just can we afford it? Yeah. Another part of your portfolio is the arts. Um, what role do the arts play at MIT? Yeah, so the arts do have, at, in some levels, a professional uh, coloration to them, but they are mainly there, I would argue, as part of the general uh, opportunity for students to engage in the creative processes. They're not alone in this. I mean, they do this in their science courses. I would argue in their humanities courses as well. But the arts, uh, we, it turns out that we get a huge number of applicants who are admitted to MIT at the undergraduate level who have significant talent in the arts, mainly in the performing arts, uh, which plays to the great strength of our music and theater department, which is a fabulous teaching and, 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 and uh, department uh, also in the areas of research from musicology to composition to performance. And so we are getting a number of students who apply here are students who would be accepted at Juilliard or at Curtis or at Peabody or at the New England Conservatory, but their parents say, no way, you're going to MIT because one, you're going to get a comprehensive education and you're also going to have a job at the end of, uh, of it all. So we know there's that tension among a number of the young people we get. Uh, the visual arts actually have graduate programs. They're not just for undergraduates. And those are professional programs. Uh, and I don't mean just simply architecture, which of course is a professional program and the oldest in the United States. Uh, but I mean visual arts. So we have graduate students who come to do the visual arts. I'm very pleased that there's been a new reorganization of our visual arts academic programs. There's been a merger of our Center for Advanced Visual Studies, which I would call the research arm of our visual arts academic program with the visual arts program, which is the academic program. They're now called ACT, um, uh, Arts, uh, Technology, and Culture, ACT. And they've just moved into the old and part of the new Media Lab buildings complex, which is fabulous for them, brand new space. And it's just a wonderful occasion to have them uh, all in gather with our Media Lab folks, with our comparative media studies people in the School of Humanities, and, uh, and of course, our list gallery, our, our, our list visual arts center is there as well. And there's a real, I think, shot in the arm that we're just beginning to apply in the visual arts that will put them yet higher up on the marquee of MIT. Are they part of the School of 
They're part, part of the School of Architecture and Planning, yes, and, and have been, uh, you know, for at least as long as I've known. Uh, and there was a moment in time when I first came here, names that are familiar to people of a certain age at MIT, Minor White, one of the great individuals in the world of photography, was on our faculty. Uh, Ricky Leacock, probably the greatest documentary filmmaker of his age, was on our faculty. I came here, I had actually heard of these people. I had not heard of a lot of people at MIT being yeah. a humanist, but these two names rang out to me. And uh, alas, one died and the other went off and retired a little early. The Ricky Leacock still comes back to campus in his 80s now. So we had, you know, great depth or real action in those areas. We're trying to rebuild and are rebuilding in some of these areas, not all of them. Are the arts at MIT different from those at other leading research universities? Or are they yes. more prominent and, and why? So I wouldn't say they're more prominent. We don't have a professional school of the arts, say, the way Yale does. Harvard does not, Yale does. So one could say, I mean, I grew up in a world that everyone knew Yale had you know, professional arts. I mean, one did, I mean, because kids would apply to Yale as, uh, for undergraduate education, and part of the attraction was they might one day go on to their drama program or their music program or what have you. Um, we don't have the, you know, a school of the arts. Carnegie Mellon has a school of the arts. We do not. School, uh, so, you know, and there's a the school of art, art and architecture. A school of architecture and, and planning, which and includes planning. the media lab. Right. Um, yes, so we have that. Right. But there's no question the accent falls not on the visual arts as visual arts as a, as a, pr a programmatic activity, right. but it actually falls on architecture as a profession, and that's where the emphasis is, and of course on media studies. So just picking up on how the arts uh, might be understood in the MIT context, what differentiates the way we do arts from other institutions? I think historically the arts have succeeded here in many ways, even though they are not at the very core of what MIT is and about. They've succeeded here because they have been very much tied in with the motto of MIT, mens et manus, mind and hand. Uh, it is the way we do arts principally is hands-on, hands-on learning. And it appeals very much to the kind of young people we attract both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Beyond that, what has always differentiated us, really, at least in modern memory, since the Second World War, I can't speak about anything be before that with any authority, and, is MIT, and again, it's really what fits with MIT, MIT is a place that is all about science and technology in the largest sense of those two words. Uh, those two cultures, if you like, which are in increasingly intertwined. Uh, and the arts here, where, they s where they're really strong and where they're headed, most importantly, is at the intersections of science and technology. It is what has differentiated us in many ways. It's not the only thing we do in the arts, but there's no question science and technology matter to the way we do arts hands-on learning matters to the way we do arts and we have just completed a long I think excellent white paper which is in the hands of the president and the provost basically charting where the arts should be in the next 10 say 20 years it's maybe preposterous of us and, and, and you know to think that one could think out 20 years but it is really all about those intersections that's our comparative advantage Having said that, not only have we been ahead of our peer institutions in the practice of the arts, I don't mean in art history or musicology, but in the practice of the arts, and I'm referring principally to Harvard and Princeton and Stanford and a few other places, they are all investing heavily now in what I would call the hands-on arts. They look to us interestingly. They know what we have. Right. They're beginning to go after our faculty in ways they hadn't. I expect them to go after economists and, 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 and chemists. I don't expect them to go after arts faculty, and they're starting to do that, and we will resist to the best of our ability. But what they're doing is building the facilities that will allow the arts to thrive at the intersections of science and technology. And that's a tremendous investment. Princeton is doing it in a very large way. Harvard is beginning to do it. We know Yale has, in a sense, already been doing it and investing, and Stanford at least has it as part of its mandate for its latest major campaign. 
And so m the way the world of our peer institutions is beginning to converge with MIT in that it is not all about, but mainly about science and technology, and why the, our peers are investing in science and technology. Similarly, they're investing in art forms and art ways of doing art that intersect with science and technology. We're still, I think, ahead of them in every area except for the facilities. <laughs> and, they, and, and, and it really is a problem that we are we faced it for a good long while. I think it will grow more intense if we don't do something about it. And, it. and we could end up on the losing end of the stick on this one if we're not careful. What triggered the white paper or, or the decision to, to look at it that deeply? Yeah. So the last time we had a systematic look at the arts at MIT was 1987 with what is called the Joskow Report. Paul Joskow chaired the committees now president of the Sloan Foundation, and he still holds a professorship on leave in economics here. And that committee created, among other things, uh, pushed for a theater arts program, which is now attached to music. And I think that was a very successful, intelligent way of doing things. It uh, pushed for uh, formal programmatic uh, degree granting in the visual arts. It pushed for new facilities. Uh, most of which we've never really built up, to be honest, though we've built up some. Uh, and it pushed for a czar or czarina, if you like, who would be in charge of what are, in effect, the extra academic arts, an associate provost for the arts. It's the position I inherited, to some extent, uh, that I hold today, though the title arts isn't in it. And that person was, you know, appointed really to represent the arts and speak about the arts and work with the deans and other faculty in the academic arts, but mainly to be responsible for the visual arts and the performing arts and to integrate things with students in better ways and so on. And that was a big step forward for, for MIT. And that was in the late 80s. And so we thought, isn't it time to take another look? Uh, it's been a good long while since the Joskow report. We've not had anything in between uh, with the depth of our new white paper. We'll see how folks uh, look at it, but I think it will be of interest to folks once we're able to, to release it. So can you say anything about surprises in it or, or things that, that surprised you as it was being done? Uh, I think the biggest surprise for me as a non-artist and a humanist who's followed the arts more from an academic administration angle was the willingness of our faculty to admit that our comparative advantage is at the intersection of art, science, and technology. Uh, there are those, and I came into that environment as a humanist in 1981, and there's still some on the faculty who believe our main job as humanists and as artists is to somehow uh, educate the heathen, meaning the engineer and maybe the scientist. Uh, it is a very arrogant kind of approach. I do understand it. When you're small, you've got to f sort of define yourself. And so, and it may be that those who brought humanists in and, and an artist in, in a, a long while back said, that's what you're here to do, leaven things, you know, bring them, or round them out, make them better at what they do. And, and to some extent, we have done that. But there is an arrogance to it. Uh, and I, I, I'm dead set against that approach and have fought it ever since I came here as a young faculty member. Um, and, but that's, I guess, what surprised me most is that times have changed and the faculty have moved with these times and they've moved in the right direction, in my, in my opinion. MIT has something called the Creative Arts Council. What is that and what does it do? Well, it's funny. We just met for the last time this year, uh, this morning, from 10 to 12. And it is a uh, toothless organization in that it rep all the leaders of the arts at MIT, from the deans of the two school to the associate provost to the directors of the list and the museum and the various uh, uh, people who are middlemen and women, you know, who, who facilitate arts programs and the like, the department heads in architecture and in music and theater and in creative writing, writing and so on are there. But we have no, you know, no official role other than to help the Creative Arts Council was also grew out of the Joskow Report, but really to represent the arts and to make sure they're looked after to the best of our ability. But we can't vote anything in. We're really only advisory to the provost and the president, and we hope they will 
through this white paper, which we, the, the council, Creative Arts Council helped to draft this white paper, yeah. that they will accept that. But we, so, you know, we're the guardians, if you like, of the arts. Uh, Anything interesting happening on the museum front, the MIT Museum or the List Visual Arts Center? Uh, where do those yeah. stand? So the museum is blessed, I would argue, with a, he's no longer new because he's in his fifth year, I believe, remarkable director who came to us from the United Kingdom, um, who is a first-rate museum director, a museum director for museums of science and technology, John Durant, uh, a visionary uh, of unbelievable proportion. He himself is an academic by training. In the, in, he's a zoologist in his first degree in the history of science and as, an, uh, as a doctoral student, as a, as a PhD. And he also holds an adjunct, which is an ad adjunct professorship in the Science, Technology, and Society program. Adjunct at MIT is an august title. It is not what adjunct is at most universities. It, to be an adjunct, you're vetted much like a tenured professor, but you're not full time. And because most of the time, he's at the museum. But he teaches. And that helps a lot because one of his visionary activities or outlooks is, is to bring the faculty closer to the museum. He knows that if this museum is really to shine, the faculty have to be behind it. And uh, he's done so well that he has recruited Philip Sharp, no less than Philip Sharp, Nobel laureate, former head of the biology department, to be the new chair of the advisory committee, which is principally an external advisory committee to the museum. He has raised funds uh, with a little help from me and others to expand the museum down to the ground floor. So we're now retail, and it has just transformed the museum. Attendance rates are way up. Um, and he has a great plan for expanding the exhibition space as well. And he just recently raised another million dollars uh, for this. So he, he is entrepreneurial, full of ideas. He's also the individual who, not I, the idea is his, though he had the staff to help him. The Cambridge Science Festival is the first science festival in any city in the United States. He created that, and now this is spreading like wildfire fire to other cities around the United States, and he is the leader in this movement. Uh, and so that has just you know, in, helped to improve our relationship in the best ways, improve our with the city of Cambridge and hopefully with the wider Boston area, which is our next you know, horizon. And since this is a big town for science, it's a great place to, you know, to have visibility around science festivals. So does he teach about running a museum? Or he does indeed. He teaches about running a museum. He, he teaches about all kinds of things that have to do with curatorial work, uh, directing. Uh, he's a Darwinian uh, in terms of his scholarship, so he's very interested in, you know, the debates in this country over Darwin and over you know, uh, learning and, and so on from Scopes Monkey right up to the present. I don't think Scopes Monkey has actually disappeared, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, so, and on the List Visual Arts Center front, this organization, this gallery, and it is a gallery, is, has a terrific national and international reputation. It is very small. Its largest problem, and the museum faces a similar problem, is space. Unfortunately, it is in very good space, but limited in the number of uh, exhibitions it can possibly do, and the hardest part of its life of existence is every time it does a major exhibition, and it does three a year, it needs to close its doors until that exhibition is mounted because there's not enough swing space. And so we need to figure out other ways of exhibiting uh, what the list does. But it has a tremendous, tremendous reputation and gets lots of attention in the media in this, in this town and elsewhere, uh, including the New York Times, I'm happy to say. And do students get very involved in it, or is it sort of off on the side and more a public thing? It's more of a public thing. Uh, the director knows that it is better known outside of MIT than it is within. Uh, it is basically helping to define the mission of the arts at MIT. I said earlier that the arts, I think moving forward, if they haven't already been, are the, it's the connectivity with science and technology. It is also all about contemporary art. That's what our, you know, purchases. We cannot go back to early modern times, to the Renaissance era, era, and build up collections. They're unaffordable. They're not what MIT is about. We can't do everything. Everything we do must be excellent. We are excellent in the area of contemporary art. That's what our visual arts program is about. That's what the new ACT, uh, the uh, Art, Culture, and Technology program is about. That's what the list is about.
And so I would, I would bet on the list becoming yet more successful. And you've got a new curator there this, this year. A young new man yeah. uh, from the drawing studio, the drawing center in New York. Uh, he's barely 30 years of age. He looks like he's been around forever, except he looks very young to me. <laughs> dynamo, true dynamo. Uh, yeah. Arribas, and uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, how he's working out. His first uh, significant exhibition will, I think, take place next fall at uh, the list. Let's back up and talk about your life and what led up to your time at MIT, um, where you were born, what was your childhood like? Yes, yeah, so I, I was born in Washington in late 1949. Washington, D.C. D.C., yes, the District of Columbia. And I literally was born in the city. No one was born in the city back then uh, because my mother uh, was a diplomat from a foreign country, Lebanon in this case, and the law was that you wouldn't have to be born in Washington, but diplomats all had to live within the city confines. That has changed. Uh, and so we actually lived in the city, not deep down in the heart of the city, but I was born there and raised there. Uh, I grew up in a family of, uh, my father was a lawyer, but also from the Arab world, and, like my mother, and so that they met in Washington. Uh, my godfather, who was then the ambassador of uh, Lebanon to the United Nations and, and to Washington, it was a small delegation. My mother was the number two in the embassy, came with him. He introduced my father, an old friend from their Boston days, to uh, my mother. And I came along, and a younger brother followed two and a half years later. And that's our family. And I've had, I would say, about as privileged a life as you can have, uh, in all candor. I mean, I really think about this a lot. Um, it worries me because, uh, you know, one day, what if you're no longer privileged? But for me, privilege is stability. That is, not having to worry about what's coming from my right and left and being comfortable in my surroundings. And I, I say this because I went to the same uh, private school in Washington from the age of three until I was 17, going to the same campus every day. It was a liberal, very tolerant uh, institution that would allow someone like me to thrive in it. Uh, later, I found out uh, that it wasn't tolerant of African Americans which it excluded until my class finally graduated some African Americans. But it was very good for v other minorities who were not always welcome uh, in society, that is, in certain institutions. So Jews, for instance, were accepted in large numbers, and the school has benefited from their philanthropy over the years. This is Sidwell Friends. Sidwell Friends. It is you know, known, of course, uh, best known for the presidents putting their children there, or vice presidents putting their children there, in the case of Al Gore uh, and Richard Nixon. Um, yeah, so, but that was privilege. And then I, I uh, it's a Quaker school, moderate, liberal, tolerant, uh, and it gave us a terrific education, and some of my best friends in life are those friends from, the, from those days. Lots of children of diplomats, sir? Uh, numbers of children of diplomats, mainly children of elected officials and, you know, secretaries of defense and the like. Uh, and so there was some transience. I mean, new administrations came and went, and, uh, but that's the world I grew up in. It's not a world of wealth. It was a world of influence. Uh, that, 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 that was it. Uh, I want to be very clear about that. It's not the wealth of New York City, not Washington in those days, never but it was the world of government. Um, did you travel to Lebanon much yes. when you were growing yes, up? Yes, we did. I wouldn't say all the time. My mother had to go back uh, from time to time. She was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 25 years. And we did, and I have a, had a large family there, most of whom have left, though I'm deeply involved with Lebanon and with uh, the American University of Beirut. I can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but yes, so I do go back. In fact, I just was there this past week and came back Saturday from Beirut. Did you know when you were growing up that you wanted to go into history? Did, was that your favorite subject? And did you read lots of history books while yeah. you were in high school or junior high? Yeah. Or? When you have a privileged education like this, you get a lot of great history teaching. Right, my calculus, my math teacher was an MIT uh, graduate. Uh, I taught his grandson here. I'm privileged to say that. He also taught me chemistry. Uh, 
but I had a lot of history, and it was clearly my best subject, the one I liked the most and I embraced. I never thought I'd become a historian. Uh, I was more, uh, I would say, a somewhat of a scholar, but as much an athlete. And uh, I wanted to play sports, and so I went to a small college where I could play three sports, or I thought I could play three sports. And, and I did that for a while and realized I could not keep it up. But, uh, but history meant a lot to me. But I thought I was going to follow my father into the law. It was a default uh, kind of thing. It wasn't that I was embracing law as a subject, but it was something I might be pretty good at, but wouldn't know for sure. At least I knew something about it through him. Uh, but I grew up in the Vietnam era, in the era of civil rights, and the 60s, uh, the late 60s, mid to late 60s were transformatory. I, I, I was transformed, and uh, I went off during my college years at Trinity in Hartford to the American University of Beirut, which is my family's university where many of them were educated, to spend a junior year, and that's what transformed me. I had not much interest in the Middle East until then. And call it identity crisis or the search for one's identity, uh, that probably you know, lay at, at the bottom of it all. Uh, I also, they admitted me, which was nice. I mean, that helped. And I came back and I knew I wanted to be a historian of that region. And I buckled down and, and uh, was able to liberate myself from my parents because they could afford to send me to school. I was dependent on them. I couldn't get a scholarship. Uh, but at one, graduate school, and it, we come back to how education is financed, graduate was more merit-based, at least in those days, I hope it still is, uh, and got a, got a scholarship to Harvard and, and went there. And, and you went right from college. Right from college and, and right into a PhD program. I had had enough Middle Eastern history courses and some language training, uh, you know, sufficient to be admitted into a door, so I never did a master's. Uh, it still took me nine years to get out of Harvard. I was two years below the mean for my program. Uh, but those were days also where funding was very generous. And uh, I spent most half of my time at Harvard abroad, two years at Oxford, a couple of years in the Middle East uh, doing research in France as well. It was a good life in the 70s. What was your final dissertation topic? Right, so I wrote about, I wanted to write about Egypt uh, in the interwar period uh, and nationalism. But when I got to Oxford as a fellow uh, from Harvard, I found uh, someone coming back from Cairo, an American who was at Chicago, University of Chicago, who had basically done the dissertation I thought I would do. It was also about a, a bank, uh, some political economy, really, is what I wanted to do. And so my supervisor, who had taught me at Harvard but was at Oxford, said, have you ever heard of Syria? I mean, jokingly, of course, I'd heard of Syria, and I traveled <laughs> there a bit. And he said, this is, you know, the archives are opening up. Uh, this is where the French were, and maybe you could get ahead of the market and get in there. And there's a great topic in the interwar period. As it turned out, very few had written about this. And so I wrote about Syria under the French in the interwar period. Again, it was about nationalism, and there was a strong urban political economy bent to it. Uh, and. Uh, and it made, helped to shape my career, no, no question about it. But you didn't veer off into political science or international affairs, or I mean, you stuck with history as your, as your central um, theme, I guess. Yeah, I probably had a very naive view of life. My mother was a sociologist before she joined the Foreign Service of Lebanon, and she spent the last 15 years of her life as a professor at George Mason University teaching international relations and law. Uh, she had her PhD and went on in that area after doing sociology. And I always f found diplomacy and international relations and the like soft, I mean really soft. Uh, that, and it may be my own bias. I adore my mother. I just visited with her on Mother's Day. She's 94 and going strong. But I, the field, I tried it. I took courses in it. It just didn't interest me. Um, Maybe I just had it wrong. Uh, it was something historical, in depth, looking for evidence. I mean, the search for evidence, spending times in dusty and, and, and dusty archives, trying to bring this evidence to the table, shaping it in some narrative that made sense in some semi-coherent way was what excited me. So, I, I went that route, and I don't regret it for a moment. Not a moment. And were there jobs for historians when you came out of? Uh Graduate so, school? So I, I, maybe it was good that I took so long to graduate because the trough for PhDs was 1975. 
when many, many people who were in graduate school with me basically bolted, went to law school or business school. They were smart enough to get into the Harvard Business School or Stanford so they could make the transition. I stuck it out, maybe because it was the Middle East field, and most of the young people I knew who were bolting were in American and European history where there were almost no jobs, it turned out. Um, I'll tell you, in all candor, I think I got a job here and at Stanford. Those were the two best places I got jobs in the year I finished. Um, largely because of the Iranian Revolution. There was a sudden recrudescence interest in the Middle East and in Islam, and I got lucky, okay, very lucky. Uh, one, that MIT took me, uh, and it was no real no, no issue for me. Between Stanford and MIT, I, I knew this was the place I, I would prefer to be at, though I went with fear and trepidation. I had no idea what it was really like, but it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I had heard of some faculty here by then, and I thought, why? and my parents knew what it was, too. <laughs> Yeah. Although it would be a very different job from a historian at Stanford, I imagine. In other words, you wouldn't have the PhD program. Program. Yeah. Um, so I, it's a great. And that didn't uh, put you off. That was a great point. So it made me a bit uncertain when I got here. Uh, I didn't look very closely at that. Uh, I just felt I was lucky to have a job and I didn't have to leave Cambridge. Stability, as I said, was very important to me. I didn't have to leave my apartment, the whole thing. But what I discovered was that, and, and really I think it's probably why I ended up in academic administration, is if you're in a small unit where the center of the earth is not around, you're not at the center of the earth, the way you learn is by reaching out across boundaries. And I have the kind of personality, uh, you know, that allows me to reach out. I mean, I'm more gregarious than introverted. I wish I were a little more introverted, actually. Probably be a better scholar. And so I, from early on, I got involved in committees, started meeting people. Uh, I started teaching in the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture in the School of Architecture. They saw I had real expertise in cities, and so I was giving the, you know, the introductory, introductory graduate course with the professor of Islamic architecture, and I did that for a number of years. And I started getting PhD students. And in political science, there were a number of students who wanted to do work about the Middle East, but there were no real specialists, so they would come to me, and the departments made me, not half time, but they, two of my four courses were in political science. And this way I got graduate students and began to supervise doctoral students in that way. And, you and then Harvard was my other back. I, I felt pro bono, I should give something back to Harvard. There was no senior person in my field at Harvard, so many of the people working on the Levant area would come and do their doctorates with me. And you weren't worried about is all of this going to add up to tenure? In other words, what does it do for the history faculty and the humanities department at, at MIT yeah. you know, that, that had to make that decision? You know, my colleagues here are fabulous, and a number of them are still here uh, who helped me get tenure, because you don't get tenure on your own in an institution this tough and this great. People are there, you know, finding you support, getting you research grants, helping, teaching you how to do it. Um, so I owe them a tremendous amount. They gave me the latitude. I think they wanted to keep me, and they feared in my position, if I left, who knows whether the then dean would say, should this position in Middle, why Middle East history? Why not another Americanist or Europeanist? At least mm -hmm. students would have heard of America in Europe, right? I mean, so I think they wanted to keep me, and so they pushed very hard to give me that freedom. And my own personality kind of played to that, and it worked out. Though I will tell you, like everyone else, I sweated tenure. And anyone who tells you it was a breeze will be deceiving you. That's my, my clear sense of things, having been dean for all these years and seen it from the other side. So MIT represented stability in terms of being in Cambridge, but very different institution from Harvard and Trinity. Do you remember what your first impressions of it were? And so you landed here and thought, oh my goodness, or? Yes, so my, my first impression, and maybe it's the point, uh, problem of having been a local boy, that is just up the river, I came down to this place, and I do recall that I went through my interview and gave my job talk, and all that seemed pretty good, worked well. And then the head of the search committee said, I want you to meet uh, a historian who wasn't able to come to your talk and 
hope you enjoy him. And I thought, oh, this is nice. Why not? And the man was almost abusive. I mean, I couldn't believe how you know, arrogant and, and making comments about the field of Middle East history. And I, I did ask myself at this moment, am I going to have to live with him? I, I, the one thing of growing up in a privileged world is you're not naive, OK? I mean, you tend to know humankind pretty well. And I said, I would not really want to spend a lot of time with this man. I later had to retire him uh, as dean. But he didn't hold it against me in the end. Um, my first impression was the roughness of the place. Uh, I had been used to the gentility of a liberal arts college and of a Harvard. And I found people a little rough around the edges. And I didn't know how, what to make of that. It wasn't my style. I'm not pretty rough. I mean, maybe I wish I were tougher. But, but I, and so I thought, well, geez, maybe I have something to contribute here. Um, not di you know, diminish what MIT is about, but bring something a little different. Not just I, but most of us were educated at Harvard or you know, one of the Ivies in the history department. And I think we all felt that we had something to contribute not a civilizing mission, but that you know, a breadth mission, bringing breadth to to our student body, opportunities for a greater breadth. And you're you're talking mostly about the students themselves, yeah, and the students. and um, brilliant, but a little rough around the edges, unwashed, I think. Okay, and that's fine. It, smart, much smarter than we were as individuals. You just felt it in the room when they got interested in something. You saw minds I have never encountered brilliance the way I, what I've encountered with MIT undergraduates. Graduate students, you know, they're great. I don't mean to take anything from them. But the, it is just unbelievable what exists in this undergraduate student body. And were they interested in history? They How many? Uh, and well, I eventually I had, uh, you know, I prided myself on uh, being a good lecturer. I had about 40 to 50 students taking my course within two or three years. When I arrived, I had lectures prepared for 100. And I got two students in my classes, OK? Two. And this is a class called what? Uh, introduction to Middle Eastern history. You know, you would have thought. And the Iranian Revolution was still flaming, OK? This is 1981. Things were still, you know, hostages and everything. It was a rough time. And the Middle East was on the front page. Between that and Lebanon, it was front yeah. page in the New York Times every day. Um, I don't know why I keep mentioning the New York Times, but it is the paper of record. Uh, and, and so and so I. I uh, I, I thought I would get many more. It's, you, ha, it ta you build up a reputation in the humanities and some of the social sciences, It really because these are not requirements for students. They, they will fulfill a requirement, but they don't have to take your course to do that requirement. Uh, Did you do any kind of marketing, or was it really just a few years of word of mouth? Yeah, word of mouth. It really was word of mouth. Did you end up with any history majors at very undergraduates? Few. Very, very few. I mean, I would say in the steady state, there might be five. By the way, we didn't introduce history as a formal major until 1990 at MIT. You could major in it, but it was called humanities. Uh, you could do it a joint degree with engineering mm -hmm. or science, a 21H, uh, E or S. But we really got these named history, literature, uh, writing, et cetera, in 1990 we passed the legislature. I was the associate dean of the school at the time. How much has MIT changed since you first arrived? What, what do you think are the biggest changes, and, and what do you think is still mostly the same? So I, I would argue that the most positive change I've ex witnessed, I can't say experienced, but observed, is the much larger number of undergraduate women. I'd like to think graduate women as well, but undergraduate women at this institution. Uh, I talked to the former president of Dartmouth two or three presidents ago who once visited me here. And I asked them what, what happened to Dartmouth when women, when Dartmouth went from the largest all men's private institution in America, 4,000 men, OK, to a co-ed you know, co institution. And he said, actually, it was terrible. You would have thought things would have gotten better. And maybe today they are better. But then he said what he experienced was, you got women who were very much like Dartmouth men, you know, outdoors, beating their breasts and drinking a lot of beer, uh, because they wanted to be at Dartmouth and were excluded from it. And so this was their opportunity to be, you know, join their brothers, as it were. Or you had women who, to survive, had to basically learn to live in that culture and survive it, and were not happy with it. Um, 
I would argue that what's happened here, and again from observation, that's all, and from talking to students, is that this is the culture is a lot healthier. There is much greater respect on the part of young men, students uh, toward women. They realize their capacities are just as great, if not greater, at, as the men in science and technical fields. I think they've always known it's never been an issue in the humanities and the arts, and even many of the social sciences, though not necessarily economics. Um, but I think they've now seen, uh, you know, that women have just as great capacity, and it's great socially for them too. Uh, poor Wellesley College has suffered a bit from that, right? Uh, as a result, our sister school. But I think that's the most profound cultural change or societal change I've seen at MIT. I think the quality of undergraduates we're getting, not the intelligence of undergraduates, but just the breadth of uh, the, the students we're getting just are able to do a lot more and they're interested in science and technology and yet they have the capacity to do almost anything really well. And so it reminds me that we're no longer uh, uh, producing the best engineers in the world or the best scientists and we've only produced some of the best, right? I mean it's arrogant to say that we're producing even the best engineers. We produce among them. But we're producing the leaders of tomorrow. I mean, who have, who are acquiring skills, and I think here's where the humanities and the arts really fit in with the social sciences and, and help add value, but we're producing the opportunity for people to go on in any walk of life and be really successful and contribute something. And to me that's, I've noticed that change in 30 years of teaching at the Institute. It's not an IQ issue, if I can even use that word and, and still walk out of this room. It just isn't. It is a breadth issue. Despite MIT's great strengths in these areas, the humanities and the arts and the social sciences, they're often overshadowed by, the, by MIT's reputation in science and engineering. And people outside of MIT sometimes express surprise that these fields even exist, let alone that they're so strong. Did you encounter that very much during your tenure as dean, and did you see it as a problem and try to address it? Uh, MIT has the strongest brand name of any research university in the world. There is nothing comparable. Harvard's name may be as well known worldwide as MIT, perhaps even better known. I don't know. I think it's, again, the further you go away, the better we're known. But I can't think of two words with a conjunction between them that describes the core of Harvard. Whereas I can say science and technology or science and engineering and you'll know and everyone will know what, what I mean. That is so powerful that it is almost impossible to, uh, and I'm not sure we want to either, I mean almost impossible to redesign that brand. Um, it, it, in a way that will allow other areas to get as much uh, credibility and much, as much attention at least worldwide. Uh, today at the Creative Arts Council, the former Dean of uh, Sloan, uh, uh, Bill Pounds, who is a person who has been chair of the Museum of Fine Arts and chair of the board of w WGBH and advised David Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family. He's done a many, many different things and is quite well known outside of MIT, not just within said try it at Sloan. We even have a name. It's remarkable how difficult it is, how few people really know that the Sloan School of Management exists at MIT. Um, this would not be the case for the Harvard Business School, if I may. Now we're much smaller than the Harvard Business School, but it's just getting that name out there is hard. Um, the Media Lab has managed to figure out how to do it. Notice it's not the Media Arts and Sciences Department or Program, which was the academic program. It's the lab. It's the research home. So I struggled with this as dean. I struggled with it as associate provost. Uh, it, I don't want to damage our brand. I don't want to tamper with it. I, I worry about that. And at the same time, I would love our administration, of which I'm a member, and maybe I'm a failed member in this way, uh, to figure out ways of giving greater recognition to the arts and humanities and social sciences than we do. Not be, you know, worried that we're going to damage it by pushing it a little more. I don't want to call this affirmative action because I, I really think that's not what we're talking about. But it really is admit where there's excellence and 
don't fear stating it to our alumni and, and to our corporation and to others. But, I mean, the excellence is, is certainly very visible. I mean, if, if you look at the wealth of Pulitzer Prize winners among the humanities faculty, for example, you have Pauline Meyer and John Dower and John Harbison and Juno Diaz, and you have your Nobel Prize winners in economics and the intellectual giants in philosophy and linguistics. And they must all get showered with, with offers from other universities. How does MIT manage to attract and hold people of this caliber who aren't in engineering and science and with that overshadowing effect going on? Great question. So I think one attraction is any educated person knows this is one of the two or three most exciting research environments in the world. Uh, university environments, maybe the most exciting, certainly best known for its innovation, uh, for thinking about the present and the future. And anyone who is interested in kind of marching with the times, I think would find MIT at least w worthy of, of visiting, spending time at. Check out the experiment, okay, and see if it holds for you, if it really, you know, is tried and, and then tested and, and it works. Uh, I also think anyone who looks around in my area or in the humanity, wider humanities and arts and social sciences, I mean, the two greatest re research universities, in my opinion, anywhere, happen to be a mile and a quarter from each other uh, in the greatest medical center in the world, okay, when you add that. And it's an academic medical center with academic research, academic hospitals, teaching hospitals. So you have, the, and you have all these other institutions. So it is very hard. I mean, you're willing to, to, to sacrifice a bit, okay, I think, to be at a place like MIT, uh, knowing that your field is not most central to the life of the institution or its reputation or future, uh, because you're in this exciting milieu in a wider world. And you're compensated quite well. I don't want to exaggerate, but you're compensated quite well. But you have a lifestyle and you're hanging out with, spending time with some of the smartest people anywhere. And that's a tremendous attraction. Uh, also, we have been ahead of our time in accepting faculty whose ideas are far out and not the orthodoxy. They eventually, at times, become the orthodoxy, and we're very proud of that, and they become very famous. So Noam Chomsky, you know, uh, can be on the outside because of the field as it was in the 50s of, of theoretical linguistics, and today it is the orthodoxy. And he, with other colleagues, brought that methodology and framework of, of analysis to this campus and made it happen. He's not alone. He may be the most famous uh, for other reasons, not just for linguistics, but others have done that, Paul Samuelson in economics. What I worry about, and we all worry about, is who are the next Samuelsons and Chomskys and Solos and, and Jerry Friedmans and, and so on? I mean. Where will they come from? The fact of the matter is we're producing them or they're coming to us. I mean, I feel it. I mean, I used to worry about that a lot more than I do today. But as an older person, I'm on the older side of the faculty now, I can see these young people doing the same things, inventing fields I don't quite understand, but they're doing it on our campus. And that's an attraction. And for humanists to be in that milieu, I mean, that's a very attractive opportunity. Is it a different kind of humanist? Is there something quirky about someone who will enjoy that rather than wanting to run for the tradition of a Harvard or Stanford or Yale? Um, yeah. So the biggest issue for my kind of people, as it were, the humanist you're talking about, is doctoral training. You have to have an ego that says, I can somehow figure out a way to have an advanced research world around me, it doesn't have to be too extensive, without having my own doctoral students. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the case of the social science, it's the case of the humanities. Uh, you have to have that kind of ego that says, I'll figure out how to do it. So if we were in Iowa, in the heart of Iowa, it would be very hard to do, frankly. You can do it in this town because of the externalities, the opportunity to uh, cooperate and do collaborative work with colleagues in and around our town. 
And that's the advantage of being in Boston, in Cambridge. Uh, and I think a number of our faculty have figured that out. You also have some faculty, and here it's just, you know, uh, who, who shows up and who's right. Uh, Pauline Mayer has never needed that. Um, she's never really taught graduate students and has not been interested in it. Mm -hmm. She has a tremendous research career. She is an archivist and a hound for the archives. She needs time for herself, and what this institution provides is the time. We have small classes in the humanities. We teach large loads compared to the rest of the institute, true, but we don't have large numbers of students, heavy grading assignments and all that, and it gives you the time to wed your research to your teaching and to bring that into the classroom and test it out on some of the brightest young people on earth. And, and that's an exciting proposition for I any of us. I remember talking with one of your music faculty members, uh, a rather prominent one, who said it was a certain relief not to have all those graduate students because it allowed him to go off and do his composing and it gave him a, a, a real window yeah. to, to focus yeah. on his own work. This is a research environment and if you want to be a scholar, researcher, and a great teacher, it's hard to find a better place, frankly. Yeah. Are there, though, questions of critical mass, um, particularly when we were talking about there being less awareness of MIT's excellence in areas like the humanities? Do you simply need more people out there for there to be a, a sort of percolating through society? Um, I think the Sloan School decided to expand partly because they said no one knew their name, they needed more people out there. Whether they have enough people out there to, to begin to have the name recognition of a Harvard Business School, I don't know. But um, that attention seems to be one issue in terms of critical mass. And also the collegiality, although maybe that becomes less so in a place like Cambridge and a world of internet. So, uh, that's a great question. Uh, it really is a great question because it's one we're debating at this very moment in the humanities uh, with the new dean who happened to be associate dean when I was dean. And she has tried what I tried and what my predecessor tried to do. And that is to figure out how can you build units of scale to give you a larger community right in the domain we work in within MIT. How can you get these disciplines, departments, which are almost sacrosanct. They have to be the discipline of history or of literature or foreign language. How can you get them to, how can you remind them that the most interesting work is at the intersection of these disciplines today? And if they really believe in that, and I think many do, they might be willing to lay down a bit some of the tough rules they have about the disciplinary nature of what they do in order to have a wider community of interests. It's not easy. So when you can't get it on the campus in a small humanity, you find it up at Harvard or at BU or BC or Tufts or whatever. And so that's what I meant about the advantages of Cambridge and Boston. But we want this first and foremost on our own campus. And that's what we're working to try to, to, to do. And here science and engineering are helping us because there has been tension between science and engineering ever since I got here. And suddenly they're laying down their swords, as it were, and saying our future really is in combining, in, you know, uh, base, uh, so the Koch Center Institute for Cancer Research, I mean, it's basically someone has to do the basic science and then who's going to deliver what we learn, right, into the human body, and that's what the engineers can do. And, and so there's going to be a lot more cross-disciplinary fertilization, there already is, and with the right facilities, and I come back to that, you might be able to do it. I think what the humanities and the arts are wanting, are not, or don't have, are the kind of facilities that would encourage this uh, scaling up, as it were, basically reorganizing how we do humanities. There's no reason for MIT to pretend it's Harvard. We're not, and nor should we ever be in the humanities. If you want to be at Harvard, you go to Harvard, and some of our colleagues have gone as a result, because that's what they want. They want a, a formal PhD culture. In, it's in their image. You're producing students who say, I'm working in your area and, I, and you're my teacher and I'm going to go on and be like you. And that's fabulous. There's nothing wrong with that. We all have egos. But that's not what we're about, nor will we ever become in the humanities. We can scale up and perhaps start doctoral programs that will be revolutionary, new, exciting, but not discipline-bound or departmental-bound. 
We're not there yet, though STS was a step in that direction that many people scoffed at, and maybe for good reason, for the ways it was created. But today, I think people will now look at it, are beginning to look at it as something very creative. Because here's an opportunity to build across, you know, amalgamate, bring together folks from different disciplines who can live in the same house, can live under the same roof, and collaborate. And that's the Science, Technology, technology and, society. and Society program. Which, does that exist in a school at MIT? It's in the or? School of Humanities, Arts, it and is. so it's a separate department, but right. it has a doctoral program with history and anthropology. Mm -hmm. And while there are tensions at all times uh, in this program, it produces and attracts and produces the best graduate students doing the history and social study of science and technology in this country at least, okay, which probably means anywhere. Uh, and, and so they've managed to do it in the little humanities at MIT. Yes, science and technology are at the core of it. So I, I, I don't want to, that we need to play to what's strong at MIT. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I meant about the arts heading definitely in that direction. Right. I would argue the humanities through comparative media studies and others have headed already in that direction. That's our comparative Although advantage. your interest in the Middle East certainly wasn't technology. At all, But, but at you all. did find places and people to uh, yeah, collaborate with. Absolutely. And you don't, you know, I'm an enrichment, right? I'm in an area they didn't have before. So they bring me in, it could have been anyone, to do what I do. Uh, but I am not the core of the humanities even. Uh, I think the person who succeeds me, if they hire someone to succeed me, that person might well be doing work in uh, Islamic science, okay, which is a very interesting field. Uh, you know, it's a big field actually mm -hmm. growing with funding. You mentioned the core curriculum a little while ago and the fact that all MIT undergraduates are required to take, I think it's still eight courses in humanities, social sciences, and the arts, as well as certain math and science courses. There have been repeated attempts in the past couple of decades, I guess, to reshape these non-math and science requirements. Can you talk about that part of the curriculum and, and how it's changed? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, when I first started here, there was a almost an amorphous uh, distribution system in the humanities. It was called the HUMD system, humanities distribution, where almost any course you designed counted. I mean, you could just make the case. It's today uh, under the latest reform, which is just being implemented. We're basically removing the title distribution, which I think confuses people. What we're trying to get at is some sort of curriculum that allows us to put blockbuster subjects in most of our disciplines as the introductory level subject that will, and they don't necessarily have to be discipline bound, okay? They may be a challenge, a theme, I mean some thematic subject, but that would be led by members of a department or two departments that will knock the socks off of our freshmen, okay, and get them excited about not just the information they're learning, but the methodologies, how, why we learn the way we do in our disciplines, okay? And if we're successful at that, and we have some examples, I've been teaching uh, really just one or two lectures a year in a course on revolutions. Now, revolutions are hardly new, but the way this course is designed is really very, very innovative in, in, in the way you can get eight or nine faculty to run a course, and, you, and the students actually feel they're talking to eight or nine different faculty. It's not just wheeling someone in and wheeling the person out, but there's continuity in the subject. And you're talking about all kinds of revolutions, not just the historical type that a historian might teach, but you know the technical revolutions that occur, and so on. And I find that if we can develop more of those, and that's the aim of the new curriculum, we will, I think, engage these very bright young people we get here from day one to value what we do. It's really valuing what we do. Most engineering faculty would say, if you're going to take a course in the humanities, arts, and social sciences, take an economics course, okay? <laughs> It'll pro and economics is the most popular and the dominant social discipline. There is no question about that, and it's tremendously successful. Uh, but you know, we know there are other things that are also very, very exciting. Plus, if there are eight semesters worth, they're, they're not likely to take eight semesters of economics. No, they, they're not. they major by then, I right. think. Right, right. You could almost major in it with eight. You could certainly minor in it. And they do minor in large numbers. Are they still being asked to spread their eight across some different yes. fields? Or yes. could uh, they do oh, yeah. them in one? No. no, they can't do it all in one, no. There has to be distribution. In fact, 
we've finally gotten the five categories that are called humanities, arts, and social sciences down to three called humanities, arts, and social <laughs> sciences. So it'll be a lot easier for students and really for their advisors to advise. Um, what's and most hard, of them are in your former school, but not all of them? No, they no. can take some courses so in... In architecture and planning architecture is the other planning. major uh, home. And it's not as significant as, as the... They have some art history, right. photography. There's a doctoral program and an undergraduate program in history, theory, and criticism in the School of Architecture. Uh, terrific humanities program, frankly. If you could wave a wand and, and prescribe a, what you would do with the eight courses, what would you do? What would I take or what would I do? Prescribe for others. What would you prescribe for yeah, others? Prescribe for <laughs> others. But the question of what you would take is sort of interesting, too. I wouldn't take all history, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I had to do it again, I would have taken the economics I did take as an undergraduate a lot more seriously. <laughs> I really, I, I've learned a lot of economics uh, basically by shepherding promotion and tenure cases and learning to read you know, the, some of the most exciting work being done, not all of which I grasp, though I'm better at it than I am at linguistics, I've found. Uh, but I, I think I, I would like to see subjects that are able both to shine positive light on the disciplines we do teach here and at the same time show where the excitement in these disciplines are, which I would argue are on the margins of these disciplines at the intersection of other, with other disciplines. And how do you do that? Can you do that with freshmen? But I would like to see more subjects of this kind sprinkled through the curriculum so that you can go at it maybe in stages or in phases. Uh, and you'd still distribute yourself across humanities, arts, and social sciences, but you're learning why interdisciplinarity. Uh, and here it is, what you're doing is you're bringing the great research enterprise that our faculty are engaged in into the classroom even more wholeheartedly, more concertedly. So I, I, that's not easy to do. It requires a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, and, but if we're moving, and that's where 21st century education ought to be in the areas I know best. So if you could take a couple of courses at MIT right now, what would you take? I think the first course I would take, and, and this would be outside the humanities, arts, and social sciences, if I may, I would love to see if I could get through introductory physics. Uh, I never had physics. Uh, I like mathematics, uh, and I, I know you have to have a certain amount of mathematics to do physics, but I have no idea if I would even survive past, you know, lecture <laughs> six or class six. But I think that is an absence, a, a void in my, my education I would love. I loved chemistry, so if I could take intro to 5111 or 3091 with these great professors. If Bob Silby taught me chemistry, the former dean of science, I would be so thrilled to, to because I've heard from students for two generations now, three, what a great teacher he is, and you've got to imbibe with Bob Silby <laughs> and others. I mean, I would find these great professors whom I know personally and admire so much, I'd love to sit in on their classes. Um, when you became dean of the school, quite a few of their courses um, of the ones that were eligible for the fulfilling requirements were oversubscribed and students ended up being put in lotteries. Were you able to do anything about that? And no, on my watch the lottery became a way of life. I was happy to say that it was often one, you know, first and second uh, choices. You usually got your second choice. Uh, in the lottery system. But you know, that is the price you pay for a boutique humanities, art, social sciences education. We're not a state school, we're not a factory, and we, we will not teach with inferior teachers. Uh, and the classes have to be small. That is a magical thing about MIT and the humanities, arts, and social well, sciences. Nice to have students clamoring at the door. It always is. Thank you for talking with us today. and. Uh, Good luck with the global problem solving and all the rest. Thank you.